Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the one to four player Sniper Elite the board game, designed by Roger Tankersley and David Thompson and published by Rebellion Unplugged, who helped sponsor this video. Based on the popular video game series, here a lone sniper is deep behind enemy lines under the cover of darkness and poised to strike key wartime objectives. That said, the enemy has superior numbers and time is on their side, making this a deadly game of cat and mouse. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, put the double-sided game board in the center of the play area with the map that you want to play on face up. For your first game, they recommend using this side that shows the launch facility. One person at the table will play an Allied Forces sniper, taking on all the other players who will assume the role of German defenders protecting a key war site. In the game, you refer to the lone player as the sniper, and any other players as the defenders. The sniper now collects the smaller board that shows the same image as the map you chose to play on, returning the other one back to the box. They now find the two decks with these backs, taking the one that shows the initials for the map they're using in this corner. SP stands for Submarine Pens, which is the map we're not using, and LF is for Launch Facility, the map we are using. The SP cards will return to the box, and the other deck will shuffle. The sniper now draws two of these cards to examine, but they must keep them a secret from the other players. These will show a playing card on one side and a secret objective on the other. If the two objectives they draw are from the same suit, they pick one to put on the bottom of the objective deck, and then they draw a replacement, and they repeat this step until they have two different suits like we see here. They then return the rest of the objectives unseen back to the box. Now arrange these aim, noise, and recoil tokens into separate piles, adding six of the aim tokens, two of the noise, and three of the recoils into this shot bag. Leave the remaining aim and noise tokens nearby, but return the extra recoil tokens back to the box. The sniper now collects the loadout cards, which show this back, and goes through them, secretly picking any three to begin the game with. These are all items that will help the sniper as they play. And there are duplicates of some of these, and if you want to take both as part of your three, that's allowed. Any they don't end up taking, they'll now shuffle into a face-down deck nearby. The sniper now collects their figure and the included dry erase marker along with their player aid. Now the defenders collect all their related miniatures. The three that show a cross on their base are known as officers, and the rest are soldiers. For your very first game, you'll need to attach the included colored bases, but just ensure there's an officer in each of the three different colored groups. Every model is known as a unit, and units with matching bases make up a squad, so each squad has one officer unit and two soldier units. On the main board, find the spaces marked with this cross symbol and set the matching colored officer on each one. Soldiers are then set on the spaces showing a colored dot that matches the color of their base. Now the defender goes through the cards with this back and picks three of them to use during the game, putting them face up on the table. These will represent the specialties of your three officers and you show this by putting a pair of cubes on each card that matches the base of the officer they represent. For example, these cubes here means that the officer model with that matching colored base represents the medic. With this done, you now also add one of these suppression tokens to each card. By the way, if you choose this Kennel Master specialty, also collect these two dog tokens to go with it. The defenders now set this countdown track on the table, adding the remaining colored cube to row 10. At the bottom of the track, they now add this sniper wound token with this side face up on the space for it here. The defenders also collect these clear tracking cubes and a player reference. Although the sniper and defending players can perform some of their setup steps simultaneously, it's important that the sniper chooses all three of their loadout cards before the defenders choose their specialties. Also, any other components you find are for the solo mode of play, which we'll discuss briefly at the end of the video. Otherwise, that's the setup. In Sniper Elite, the board game, one player takes on the role of the sniper, who must complete their two objectives before being wounded twice or the time runs out on the countdown track. 
The rest of the players control the defenders, who win in the opposite way, either by stopping the sniper from completing their objectives before time runs out, or by wounding the sniper twice. If you have three defenders, each will control one squad, which you'll remember are the groups of officers and soldiers with matching bases. If you have two defenders, each controls one of the squads and then makes decisions together about the third. And if you have just one defender, they control all three squads. Now, before we get into explaining how to play, I think it would help to take a quick tour of the board. As we know, this shows a map, and the map is broken into four sectors, each with a colored outline bordering its sector. Three of these sectors will have matching colored defenders in that area. For example, in this yellow sector, we have three yellow defenders. The one exception is the white sector, which doesn't contain any defenders and may be split into more than one section. You can see we have some of it here and the rest of it here. Although defenders start in specific sectors, they'll be able to move into any sector over the course of the game, as we'll see. Each sector is divided into spaces separated by either white or black lines or the sector borders themselves. Spaces with white lines are open spaces representing outdoor or wide open spaces. Spaces with black lines are enclosed spaces and are thicker where they border an open space to represent a wall. A white line with two arrows is a doorway you can move through to enter and leave enclosed spaces, but we'll discuss movement more in a moment. The nine numbered spaces you'll find all over the map represent the possible objective locations the sniper will be trying to get to. And each of the sniper's secret objectives will show one of those values. This tells the sniper which spaces they need to visit to complete them. The suit on the card represents what area the objective is in. For example, objectives 3, 4, and 1 all show a club, and these are all found in the yellow sector. While objectives 5 and 9 both show diamonds, and these are both in the red sector. Remember, during the setup, the sniper's objectives had to come from two different suits, which means that each objective will always be in a different sector. Each sector also has an entrance arrow represented by these symbols. These are the possible locations the sniper will enter the map from at the start of the game. There are also a few other symbols on the board, but we'll discuss them later. The game is played over a series of rounds, and each round begins with the sniper taking their turn, and then the defenders take theirs. So let's see how a sniper turn works. On their very first turn, the sniper must look at their objectives and figure out what sectors they're in. In this case, they're in the yellow and red sectors. They now pick and mark an entrance arrow on the hidden board from one of the other sectors. This represents where they'll enter the board. Throughout the game, the sniper will secretly mark their movements on their hidden board, which shows the exact same map as the main board. And the other players should make it easy for the sniper to do this privately. They should not be trying to peek. Now, marking the entrance is only done at the very start of the sniper's first turn. And now they'll carry out the rest of their turn as normal. On a turn, they can move and take one action and use one loadout card and do this in any order. And they can skip doing any or even all of those things if they want. Just know you can't split your movement up during a turn. In other words, you can't start moving, stop, perform an action, and then keep moving. Now with that in mind, let's learn how moving works, but just know all of the sniper's movement happens on their hidden board. They don't place their figure on the main board and then move it around, but instead they mark it here, as we'll see. Now, with that understood, to make it easier for me to show you how movement works, I will put the figure on the board and move it around. When the sniper moves, they go either 0, 1, 2, or 3 spaces on their turn. And we'll assume that they move 3 spaces in this example, and when moving, you must always go from the space you're in to an adjacent space. And spaces are adjacent if they share any part of the same line. The very first move you make in the game is leaving the arrow and entering the space it points to. So we might go here, 1, then here, 2, and 3 to here. After moving, mark the current round number into the space you moved into on your hidden board. And the current round is the row the defender's action markers are in. So we would write a 10 here. I also like to draw a line showing my path, as it can be fun to show your moves to the other players when the game is over. Again, remember, the sniper doesn't actually move their figure on the main board. That's kept off to the side. They just trace a path 
on their hidden board, and the space they put the round number in reminds them where they're now standing. Next, I'm gonna set up a few examples like we might see later in the game to explain some other rules for movement. As the sniper, you can never choose to enter a space with a defending piece, so keep that in mind when tracing your path. But since your figure usually isn't on the main board, it is possible that an enemy could move into your space. But you don't say anything if that happens. You can just assume you're safely hiding somewhere unseen within that space. Also note that the only way to move from an open space to an enclosed space is through an opening which will show this symbol, and the same is true if you want to leave. Spaces marked with this symbol are water spaces and cannot be entered, while a space with this symbol represents difficult terrain. Any model, a sniper or defender, reduces their maximum movement that turn for each space of difficult terrain that they enter. It might be easier to think of the sniper as having either zero, one, two, or three points of movement depending on how far you want to go on your turn. And each space they move will normally cost them one point of movement, but it costs them two to enter a space with difficult terrain. So by moving from here to this difficult terrain, they'd be spending one, two, three points of movement and would have no more and must stop. If they'd started here instead and wanted to enter this space, they couldn't because that would cost one, two, three, four. But at most, you only have three points of movement if you want to think of it that way. Now, as I mentioned, you can decide not to move at all on your turn and just leave your model where it was. On the sniper's turn, if they chose not to move, or if they only moved one space, then they spent the turn carefully sneaking, and after marking their current position on their hidden board, their move is over. However, if they moved two or three spaces, they were rushing, and after marking their new location, they may now have to give up some information. Again, this is only if they moved two or three spaces, and if so, they check their movement to see if it started, ended or passed through any spaces adjacent to defending models. If so, they must point to those models in any order they like, not necessarily in the order that they passed them, to indicate that those figures heard a noise. This lets the defenders know that at some point during the sniper's move, they were adjacent to those spaces. In a case like this, the sniper did not move adjacent to any figures, so even though they moved three spaces, no models were alerted. On their next turn, if they moved two spaces to here, both this space and the one they ended up in are adjacent to defending figures. So they would now touch both to indicate that those models heard a noise. It doesn't matter that these are inside of a building, all that matters is that the spaces are adjacent. Thematically, it helps to consider that the walls might have open windows, so a guard would hear someone running by. It's worth mentioning if the sniper moved just one space onto this difficult terrain on their next turn, that would not alert the defenders. Even though they spent two points of movement, they've only moved a single space. Moving into difficult terrain is slower than moving into a normal space, but it's not noisier. During the game, defenders can use these clear cubes to mark spaces that they think the sniper might be in. And if they ever run out of cubes, they can feel free to use coins or any other suitable replacement. Just remember, if you only moved zero or one space, it doesn't matter what models you're adjacent to, you won't make noise and don't have to give any information away. Now, along with moving, the sniper can also perform one action, and there are three to pick from. So let's start by learning the shoot action. And to help with examples, we'll again place the sniper on the board. Just keep in mind this model <laughs> is not necessarily going to be on the board when you're playing. To perform a shoot action, you must secretly pick a target within your line of sight. That is, it must be a target you can see. So let's go through the line of sight rules now. You have line of sight to a target if you can trace a straight line from any edge of the space you're in to any edge of the space your target is in without going through any enclosed spaces. Going through is the important keyword here, so I'll be repeating it with many examples to make sure that it's clear. The sniper in this space has line of sight to this defender because I can find a spot somewhere on this square's edge to draw a straight line to somewhere on this box's edge without going through an enclosed space. 
Now this might surprise you, but our sniper here has line of sight to this defender, even though there are enclosed spaces between them. Because remember, you're not drawing line of sight from one model to another, but from one space to another. And I can draw a line from this space here over to the space our target is in without going through an enclosed space. Even though the models on the table aren't moving, this represents a soldier that is patrolling the space they are in back and forth. So thematically, you would imagine that the sniper is waiting here on this corner until their target walks into view and then they take the shot. On the other hand, if the sniper was here, these models wouldn't have line of sight to each other because all lines drawn from this space to the target's space would go through enclosed spaces. Let's say we had our two models in these spaces. These have line of sight to one another because even though the target of the sniper is inside an enclosed space, the line we would draw does not go through an enclosed space. A line going into or out of an enclosed space is not the same as a line that goes through one. And as we've repeated, that's the key test for line of sight. Now you might be thinking, but isn't this a wall? Doesn't that block line of sight? It doesn't because although you can't see them, the walls of these buildings would have windows. So again, you need to imagine that the sniper takes its shot once the soldier walks by one. Now let's say our soldier was here. Line of sight is blocked to this target now because the line would go through an enclosed space. There is one exception to the examples we've been seeing. If you're shooting from an enclosed space and every space your line of sight goes through is also an enclosed space, then your line of sight is not blocked. In other words, if you're in the same group of enclosed spaces as your target, you have line of sight to every other space within that area. From an enclosed space, you can also target open spaces outside of it. So I could target this model here because again, my line of sight doesn't go through any enclosed spaces. On the other hand, I can't target this space here because although it's adjacent to an enclosed area that I'm in, the line that I would draw from this space goes through an enclosed space. And since this model isn't in the same enclosed area with me, there's no line of sight to it. Now check out this example where we have the sniper in an enclosed space and the defender is in a separate enclosed space. I still have line of sight to this model because although they don't share the same enclosed area, my line of sight does not go through an enclosed space. If the model was back here, then we'd have a problem because now we would be passing through an enclosed space. As we wrap up the rules for line of sight, be aware that water spaces do not block line of sight. And if you ever need a refresher on the line of sight rules, the rule book has excellent pictures covering several examples. I covered a lot of examples too because I really want to make sure that you're clear on how you pick your targets. But the sniper doesn't say who their target is. They keep that to themselves. For the sake of our example, let's say the sniper is here, but remember, the figure itself won't be on the board, and let's say they've secretly picked this soldier as their target. The sniper now takes the shot bag and declares out loud how many tokens they're going to draw from it. This warns the defenders that a shot is about to happen. We'll say they declare four. Then without looking, the sniper draws four random tokens from the bag and reveals them. To hit a target, you must draw as many of these aim tokens as the number of spaces your line of sight passes through, including the target space. Now, if there's more than one valid line of sight from your space to the target, you use the one that passes through the least number of spaces. So in this case, I need a minimum of one, two, three aim tokens to hit my target, but I only drew two, which means I missed. If as the sniper you missed, you don't declare who your target was, but this can still provide useful information to the defenders, especially if they already had a rough idea of where the sniper might be and the direction they might be heading. On the other hand, if you reveal at least one aim token for each space your line of sight passed through, including the target space, then you've hit your target. Here, our line passes through each of these spaces and ends here, and we've drawn at least three aim tokens, so it's a hit. When you hit your target, remove it from the board and pass it to the defender, who will keep it beside them. Defending pieces can then be returned back to the board later, as we'll see. If you shot a soldier, you now take an aim token from the supply and add it to your bag. You've panicked the soldiers that remain, which will make them easier to target in the future. 
If you're shot removed an officer, you instead take the suppression token from their card and add it to your bag, and we'll see how these tokens help you shortly. Now, I had mentioned that models can be returned to the board. So if this officer did get returned to the board later and then is shot again, the sniper does not get another suppression token as it was already taken. So instead, they add an aim token to their bag. Now, I will mention the tokens here are limited. So when there's no more of a type to add to the bag, you just don't get more of those. Okay, now remember, the sniper decides how many tokens they want to draw from the bag. So you may be wondering, why don't they just draw a whole bunch to ensure they get the aim tokens they need? Well, good question. Let's say I instead had chosen to draw eight tokens out of the bag. Sure enough, I had a successful hit, but if you ever draw two or more of these noise tokens, you've revealed your position and must put your sniper on the board. So the more tokens you draw, the greater chance you'll create noise. If you ever draw these suppression tokens, they help with noise. And for each one drawn, you ignore the effects of one noise token. So in a case like this, it's as if I had only drawn one noise token, so now I wouldn't have to reveal my position. Also, if you draw five or more combined recoil and noise tokens, you misfire. This means no matter how many aim tokens you also drew, your shot still misses. And if the draw also included at least two noise tokens, that reveals your position as well. And while suppression will reduce noise, it doesn't affect misfires. So in a case like this, if we had drawn these nine tokens, the suppression does cancel one noise for the purposes of revealing your position, but you still count all of the noise and recoil tokens when checking to see if you misfired, so in this case, you would have. And those are the main rules for shooting. But there are a couple of little things we also need to keep in mind. First off, you can't shoot from the starting position. Your first action of the game must always be to move, but then during that turn you can shoot if you want. And I'll say it just one more time as another reminder, your model won't actually be on the board. You'll be marking its position on your hidden board. Now, if an enemy has moved onto the sniper's space, and we'll assume the sniper is here, the sniper can shoot that model on their turn, but this still counts as a distance of one, so to hit their target, they'll need to draw at least one aim token from the bag. Okay, with all that understood, no matter the outcome of a shot, the sniper now returns all the tokens that they drew back to the bag. If the sniper had been revealed after shooting, they leave their figure on the board. But if they haven't performed their move yet this turn and then decide to move, they leave their figure where it is. They don't show where it moved to. The figure is just the last place that they were seen. With that, we've learned the shoot action. But on your turn, you may instead choose to perform the complete and objective action. If you're standing on a numbered space matching an objective that you're holding, you may choose to reveal that objective and then put your sniper on that space. That objective is complete, and you now add a noise token from the supply to your bag. This represents the defenders going on high alert. We'll see later that as rounds pass, these action tokens will move down this board, and the sniper must complete at least one objective before these all get down to the bottom row. However, as soon as they complete an objective, all of these markers are moved back up to the top row, which means the sniper now has 10 more rounds to complete their second objective. If the sniper completes their second objective, the game ends and the sniper wins. Now though, let's look at the other type of action they can instead take on their turn, looting. To loot, the sniper must be on a numbered objective space that doesn't match one of their objective cards. They then draw three cards from the top of the loadout deck, look through them, secretly choose one of them to keep, and then they shuffle the other two back into the deck. Looting does not cause the sniper's model to be placed on the board, but they do have to mark that space off on their hidden board as a reminder that they may not loot that space again. By looting, the sniper is revealing to the defenders that they're currently on a numbered space, but they don't say which one they're on. And now that we've seen how you gain new loadout cards, we should take a moment and explain how they work, because remember, on the sniper's turn, they can move, perform one action, and use one loadout card. To use a loadout card, you take it from your hand and place it face down on the table. It will have an effect, but you don't reveal the card until it tells you to. 
For example, if I play this sound masking loadout card, it says I get to ignore any negative effects from moving two or three spaces this turn. In other words, I wouldn't have to tell the defenders if I moved adjacent to them during that turn. Now to gain this effect, I just play the card face down the table in front of me. And only at the end of the game, as it says here, do I reveal it. After playing this S-Mine face down, it lets me mark my current location with an X on my hidden board. Then if an enemy ends their move on that space, they are immediately killed, and then I would reveal this card at that exact moment. Once a loadout is revealed, you just leave it face up on the table. It doesn't go back into the deck. We won't go through all the various abilities on the loadout cards as how they work is described directly on them, but you can also check this area of the rulebook if you have any questions. And that's how you take a turn as a sniper. Again, they can move, take one action, and play one loadout card in any order. And after the sniper goes, it's then the defender's turn. There are three different squads that make up the defender's forces. Each are made up of two soldiers and one officer. And each individual model is also known as a unit. So in total, there are nine units the defenders have to work with. And during the defender's turn, each squad can take up to two actions. But you can have the squads act in any order. The red squad might take an action, then the black squad might take an action, and then the red squad can take their second action, and so on. To help keep track of this, as a unit takes an action, you move a matching colored action cube down to the next row. Now we know that the red squad has only one action left, but we could instead take an action with one of the other squads first. A squad taking an action has seven different ones to pick from, and they can pick any two different ones to perform, or pick the same one to perform twice. So let's go through each of them. One option is to move up to two spaces. Defenders move like the sniper does, except that they can move through each other's spaces as long as they don't end their move in a space with another defender. Although they can end their move in a space with the sniper when its model is on the board. If the sniper model isn't on the board, a defender might still move into its space, but if this happens, the sniper doesn't say anything to confirm that they're there as well. Also, although units start in a particular sector, they can move into any sector they like over the course of the game. Next, we'll discuss the sweep action. With this, you pick a unit and up to two matching adjacent spaces. Matching adjacent spaces are adjacent spaces that share the same type, for example, enclosed or open. If I was sweeping with this unit, it's on an enclosed space, so the two adjacent spaces I picked for the sweep must also be enclosed. I couldn't pick this open space, for example. After picking the spaces, let's say I chose here and here. If the sniper is in either of them, or the space the unit is in, they must say so. But they don't say which of those spaces they're in. Now instead of sweeping, you might perform a spot action. To do this, pick any space adjacent to a unit, which can even be through a wall. This does not have to be a matching adjacent space, so I might have this unit spot into the space here. If the sniper is in that exact space, they must place their miniature there, and then they add one noise token from the supply to their shot bag. Another action is to attack, but defenders can only attack their own space. So pick the unit that's attacking, and if the sniper is in that space, they must place their miniature there, and then they receive a wound. When the sniper takes their first wound, you flip this token. If they take a second wound, the defenders all win the game. Now you might be wondering, what's to stop a defending unit from attacking twice during a round, killing the sniper all at once? Well, the catch is that although a squad can perform the same action twice during a turn, a single unit can't perform the same action twice. So if I attacked successfully with this unit, I couldn't attack again with it this turn. It's also important to remember that you can't have two units in the same space, meaning another soldier wouldn't be able to move in and finish off the sniper. That said, there are some officers like this one who can attack from longer range, as you'll discover when playing. Deploying an officer is another type of action. To do this, just return a squad's officer that isn't on the board back to the space that shows its matching colored cross. 
Deploying a soldier is a similar action, but to do this, its squad's officer must be somewhere within its matching colored sector. So while the officer is here, you can't deploy any red soldiers to the board. But if it was here, we could perform this action to place the soldier we're returning to the board in any matching adjacent space. And that space could even be in another sector. Just know that deploying a soldier counts as an action the soldier took, not the officer. So this means two soldiers could be deployed beside the same officer within the same turn, since it isn't the officer taking the same action twice. Or you could just deploy one soldier and then for that squad's second action, have that soldier take a different action. Dismissing is the final type of action a squad can take. To do this, remove any soldier or officer from the board. Just know they cannot be deployed back to the board during the same turn. You might dismiss a unit in order to be able to place it in a better position on a future turn, or if you think the sniper might attack it. Now, I had said that during the defender's turn, each squad can perform up to two actions, but a squad actually has another option. Instead of taking two actions, they can gather intel. To do this, the chosen squad's officer must be in its own sector, but its soldiers can be anywhere, even off the board. Now that squad can't have taken any actions this turn, and instead moves both of their related cubes down at the same time. Then the sniper must declare if they are anywhere within the sector matching that squad's color. They don't say what space they're in, just only if they're in that sector or not. It's a powerful action, but it means that squad won't be able to do anything else this turn. But be aware that more than one squad can gather intel during the same turn. Okay, so that's how the defender's actions work, but each officer also has a special ability that they can use either before or after any action, or before or after gathering intel. So let's see how those work. Each officer has a special ability printed on the card that has their matching colored cubes, and they do not have to be within their own sector to use the ability, they just have to have their model on the board. As an example, the officer with the Kennel Master ability can place a dog token in their current space where it will stay for the rest of the game, even if they end up moving to a different space. And from now on, the sniper must alert the defenders if the sniper ever moves into or through the dog's space. But they don't say anything if they just move into the space adjacent to the dog. They also don't say anything if they happen to be in the space at the moment the dog token is placed into it. They're staying very still. Of course, when they move out of the space with the dog, that will alert it. Each time you use a specialty, you return one of the cubes on that officer's card to the box. And once both of its cubes are gone, the special effect cannot be used again during the game. The defenders can use the abilities of multiple officers in a single turn, but they can't use the same ability twice within the same turn. We won't go through all the specialist abilities in this video as how they work is described on them, but if you have any questions, check this sidebar of the rulebook here, which covers a few special cases. And those are all of the things the defenders can do on their turn, and if they want to skip taking an action with a squad, they can just move the related cubes down to the next row. Either way, once all of the defenders' cubes have been moved down to the next row, their turn is over and it's time for the sniper's turn again. At the start of a sniper's turn, if their figure is on the board, they now take it back. That said, if the players prefer, they can leave it on the board as a reminder of the last place the sniper was seen. Just keep in mind, this isn't necessarily where the sniper is now. And those are all of the rules. If during the game, the sniper completes their two objectives, they win. If the defenders wound the sniper twice, they win. They also win if the defender's action cubes are already on the final row of the countdown track at the start of their turn. This means time has run out for the sniper. In this video, we haven't covered the other map you can play on, the submarine pens. This has elevated spaces which represent different levels players can move on, and it has obstructions which can block line of sight. When you're ready to play this map, check this area of the rulebook here, which will go over some of its unique features. And you'll also want to check how elevation affects line of sight on this page as well. If you're interested in adjusting the difficulty level for one of the sides, either the sniper or the defenders, you can find ways to do that here on the back of the rulebook.
And there are also rules and components for solo play that are explained in this separate included rule book, but those I'll leave for you to discover on your own. Otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play your first game of Sniper Elite, the board game. If you have any questions about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can join our Patreon team, which I'll have linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.